Hello guys, thank you for tuning in. This is Maria Stefanova with Wednesday Night Conversations, where we strive to inspire music educators through sharing their ideas. This is a conversation with Dan Whistler, newly appointed music director of the Albuquerque Youth Symphony. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. This is great to be here. You're stepping into a very new environment at a very difficult time. Tell us a little bit about your experiences. That's that's really great, um, and it's uh, it's so neat to see that you know I'm not the only one out there who's taking on new challenges. In fact, I think that there's a lot of people that I've talked to that are you know taking new jobs, um, and in some ways we all are in a new job, even if it's something that we've been doing for 20 or 30 years. I think we're we're all in this same boat. Um, and so when people ask me, it's like, well, what, what made you really, you know, be crazy enough to move 1300 miles in a, in a pandemic to, to take on a new position? It's like, well, I'd, I'd be basically facing the same challenges back home. So I might as well face uh, some new challenges in a, with new people in a new location. So um, I think it's just great. And, uh, um, you know, we've been so connected lately with, with everyone. So I think that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Stepping into a new position always creates the challenge of engaging and developing a new community of people. And as we progress through this channel, we'll be talking quite a bit about leadership and leadership creating community through music. Tell us a little bit about your experiences. Well, oh, great. I think that, um, you know, some general tips uh, that I would probably give to a, a person you know, especially if they're doing this for the first time, if you're if you're new to the profession, new taking a job, you know, I was given some some great advice starting out. Some of which I heeded, some of which I did not heed as much. Um, so <laughs> I can learn from from both of those things, and I could definitely just kind of share that with you and, and with the other ones, just in case there's any tips out there that maybe some some of our listeners might not have heard before. Um, I think that one of the big ones that that they told me was, you know, to make sure and get familiar and friendly with all of the behind the scenes people at wherever you're taking, taking charge of, because, um, you know, they're going to be the ones that are really running the show and are going to make your job in life so much easier and therefore give you more time with the students and make that experience even better for them. People like custodians, people like bookkeepers, people like secretaries, you know, all these people that are, you know, the behind the scenes ones, I think that's the biggest one. So, um, and those folks too, I mean, they, they usually work very hard in the office. They're usually not paid as well. Um, and a lot of times people just really come to them with, with negativity. So it's really important, I think, to build those relationships and to have conversations with them, not just, Hey, here's what I want. <laughs> Cause I feel like they get that a lot. So I always made it, you know, I tried to stop by the office, stop by those, you know, places every day just to kind of start up some conversations. Um, even just, again, just building that um, relationship with your colleagues as well. I was told one of the, one of the tips I was told as a new teacher starting out um, was to eat lunch with your, with your colleagues if possible. Um, and I didn't heed that at first. In fact, I, you know, I did what a lot of people do, I think is, is just to try to use that extra couple minutes of planning. Like, Oh, I can actually maybe go home a little bit earlier if I do that now, you know? Um, but man, that just that made all the difference in the world when you when you really become really good friends with your colleagues, and that that's you know just such a, a great thing for the environment of the school or wherever you're working. Um, and the students pick up on that, you know, and they they think it's so cool when oh wow they're they're actually like getting along and stuff like that. You know, it was it was always a neat experience. So those were some of the ones that I heard um, kind of before I started. And I, I'd probably even add some more to the list. Um, uh, especially for our, for our new folks. Um, reaching out to your predecessor, I think, is very important, um, if you can. I, I've been very fortunate in that regard, that I've had great relationships for the people that have, that have come before me in the various positions I've taken. You know, I, I still will usually call them up in case I take, like, a new job. It's like, you know, that, that kind of relationship. Because, I mean, you know, your your first year of, of, of a new position is basically detective work, I think, in a lot of ways. You're trying to, to 
put all these mysterious pieces together um, to, to make something new and, and, and work for people. And, and nobody is going to have more evidence for you than the person who was there before you, because they're going to know a lot of the kind of hidden challenges that no one else, not even the supervisor, not even a principal, not even um, other people in the building, uh, nobody's going to know that better than that person. So if you can somehow reach out and build a relationship with that person, that's going to be a huge advantage when you're starting out. Philosophically, what are your ideas about engaging young musicians? So um, having taught for about nine years before taking this position, I taught in a couple different places. Um, I've also been um, – going around to different conducting master classes. I think I've been to about 15 or 16 now, but I would say philosophically um, the one that had the greatest impact on me by far was one that I did actually just last summer ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, but it was the summer of 2019. It was um, in Aruba of all places <laughs> led by one of the greatest, I think, um, music teachers that's ever walked the earth, which is Benjamin Zander. Um, so I got to study with him, and it really just kind of changed the way I view my classroom, view my uh, kind of relationship with students, and even just just kind of my my role um, as mentor, teacher, conductor, musician, just everything. So. Um, I spent the entire last year in my youth orchestra position um, and my school teaching position uh, kind of playing around with, with his teachings and setting up my class in a new way um, that had just such really positive impact. Um, I wish I could pull along a, a, a student that I would have like behind the, the you know, wall or something to, to, to join and give their feedback on it, but maybe for a later day. But um, I think it'd be really cool to just actually kind of talk about that experience for a little bit and kind of share with you an example of, of how I can introduce this very simple but, but kind of heady philosophical uh, idea to, to any classroom. So, so this is kind of what, yeah, this is kind of what I would do. Um, so I would usually say where it came from and say, Hey, I was lucky enough to go to Aruba to, to <laughs> do this master class. And it was a conducting master class. So I was there to conduct things. One of the things I would conduct was, uh, the, a Dodgetto for string orchestra from Mahler five. And I usually get a lot of, you know, kind of blank looks and a couple, couple knowing kids in the audience that have really cool, you know, Spotify playlists might know what that is, but they might not. So I usually sing a little bit of it. Um, usually get a C first off. Usually by the time I get there, there's usually one kid that's like, I know what that is. But I usually keep going. Usually leave them on that half cadence to make them kind of go, what comes next? Um, so I was up there conducting, and everything was going really well. And the teacher giving the class, named Ben Zander, if I give the name at that point, goes, uh, you know, that's, that's going just fine, but it's missing something. He said, it's missing love. So he's like, I want you to do that with love. So, of course, I'm up there like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to try to. <laughs> so, so I was, you know, trying to come up with different ways of doing it. And, you know, over, over a couple days of, of working on it, I finally achieved it and it was the coolest thing. So we performed the piece with love. And um, so that's, that's kind of an example of that experience. So that, that was the vibe of this class for 10 days, right? It was just a, just quite the journey. Um, but at the core of the class was um, Xander's art of possibility philosophy, which he calls it. It's a very simple concept. It's a concept that even a small child could understand um, it's basically understanding that any single reality that we face uh, has two narratives, which he called 
one of which the downward spiral, which usually, I have some supplies here, is a realm of thinking that involves fear and doubt and jealousy and all those negative emotions that result in it, right? So we could imagine a, a giant downward spiral that even shows up on the screen. I think it shows up okay. Um, you know, with, with, with all of that, it has highs and lows, right? Um, it's anything that's measured. So anything like auditions or grades or competitions, it has, you know, moments of elation where we might win and win a competition or, or, um, get an A on a test or something, but then it also has anxiety as it's, you know, we're thinking about the next time, which we might fail. Right. So it's a, it's a world of, of, of doubts and, and successes and failures and all this stuff. The other world is a world of radiating possibility, he calls it. The world of joy and love. This is a very poorly drawn uh, sun with little radiating arrows coming out of it. Um, of joy, love, relationships, um, all the good vibes, basically. Um, and students definitely know this downward spiral world very well. Um, and musicians know this world very well. Right. We're often told that, well, that's just the way the world is. You know, it's they're they're out to get you. You have to, you know, work harder than other people and succeed. And if and if you don't, you know, get them first, they're going to get you. So, you know, I mean, we have to have this like hard shell with everything. Um, and so that's that's one of the one of the narratives. Um, and I usually tell students that with all this in mind, even though that's the way the world is, there's a large group of people in our society that live in this realm of possibility all the time. I usually give them a think while to think about who that, who that might be and uh, might maybe give them some hints along the way. But usually a couple of the students think, Oh, well, little kids, right? Um, if a five-year-old walked into this room right now, we would have no choice, but to give them our undivided attention. Right? <laughs> As that happens a lot in Zoom calls and things. Um, I'm at the office. Fine. Hopefully there's no five-year-old kids here, but we'll see um, to prove the theory. But that, I mean, that undivided attention, that's, that's power. And um, all of us had this power. We all had that power as small kids, but along the way we lost it. You know, we, you know, maybe, maybe you like drawing and, and, were all about that and would draw pictures and share them with everyone you saw. But one person along the way said, you know, that's not, not the best drawing of a, of a dog. And you're like, Oh, I guess, I guess that's not a very good drawing of a dog, you know, or, or maybe you were one that raised your hand in, in class, you know, just, just with, without hesitation. And, but, but at some point we're, we're laughed at or, you know, and, and all those, all those little moments that we go through in life kind of start to add up. And build this build this hardened layer, and we kind of lose our lose our power that we had. And and part of this possibility mindset, it's very important for everyone is um, you know to to rediscover our lost powers. And so um, uh, I, I always give the students then their their first possibility assignment, which is to rediscover the powers that you had lost as a small child. <laughs> And if you aren't sure, I would you say is to try to find someone that who knew you as a small child, because um, they would have some some good ideas. But and that's the thing, even even for you know upper elementary, middle school, high school kids. I mean, they're they're already like you know way locked in. You know, especially at the beginning of a year. You know, those those poor new freshmen, or if they're new to the building, I mean, they just walk around like this for like for weeks. You know, and and um, and they'll 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 know what that's about. I, I once had a uh, student uh, who I gave this assignment to. Um, she was quiet. She was shy. She had some health problems, you know, all these things. And um, she told me later that, that when she had kind of went on this journey, her, her mom once told her, uh, they, they called her Lizzie when she was a little bitty kid, a nickname. And she's, the mom says, you know, I don't know what happened, but I, I just saw her Lizzie again. Um, and it was just such a cool thing. So, so that's kind of their, their first charge. Um, how I keep this going in, in the classroom uh, in the long term 
is that I do what Xander did for us, which he would give us what he called possibility assignments to just kind of keep that, keep that spark going. Um, I would do it every week. I do a weekly assignment um, the first day of the week. So if it's like Monday on a typical week or um, my high school rehearsed in a block schedule. So we did like a Monday, Tuesday thing. So it might be Tuesday when I would see my first ensembles, that kind of thing. But, um, and my youth orchestra also rehearsed every week. So I would usually coordinate that together. But so every week I would give them a new possibility assignment, like rediscover the powers you had lost as a small child. That was always the, the first one I would do because that was usually immediately you know conjuring up a lot of different memories and emotions just to kind of get get people on the on the right track um i found that sharing is vital to this process right so every week i would give a new assignment to think about or sometimes extend extend an old one if i really felt like oh we need more time with this one guys this is a bigger one you know um but i would also you know sh so have some time share some anecdotes let the students share um i found that you know, with my, my time in Aruba, uh, Xander gave us about nine, nine assignments. He gave us one every day. And so I had these nine really awesome ones that were a core structure to, to work these around. But, you know, that's nine isn't going to cover a school year, much less, a, you know, a, a, a time with the, with the student, four years specifically. Um, so a lot of those assignments that I would come up with would be from either inspirations from other sources, but a lot of them were from students themselves because they would be thinking in this, in this way. And, 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 you know, one of them saw a, a, a rainbow in a, in a mud puddle once. And so she was like, you know, I, I've, I've just been trying to find the beauty in the mundane. So I was like, man, that's like perfect. That was one of our weekly assignments. It was great. It's from, girl named Brianna so I'll, I'll never forget her you know it's awesome so um so I would I would set aside time um you know five ten minutes every every week of of class for this and um you know it could be uh with our with our stuff now you know we could still kind of do that through through zoom it's not quite quite the same but it, it could be you know something we can do um and uh, to give you some ideas on some what some of these other assignments were, here, here's a couple of my favorites. So I've, I've written some of these down here. So um, the first one that Xander gave us was notice the contribution that you are. Um, it's a great one, especially for adults, because it was he was inviting us, you know, to not think about, you know, am I worthy to be here? Um, you know, it's it's that it's not if you you are a contribution it's that you are and you simply have to notice that you are so for a lot of times for my for my youth orchestra kids especially I'll, I'll make that a very early assignment because you know a lot of times they'll they'll have they'll have competed with each other to get into a certain ensemble right they're kind of oh, i'm going to be better i'm going to be first chair and it's and it's um can be very disheartening for for an organization if if that's the that's the underlying current so um, so that's one of my favorite ones that I threw out first. Um, be more generous than you think you have the resources for. That's one that sounds like it should be in emails that we forward on, but it's, you know, it's not just money generous, but it's time. It's, it's affection. It's, it's so many things that we kind of close off to others. Um, make eye contact fearlessly and with love. That's another great one that's going to be tough to practice with all these Zoom meetings for a while, but maybe in the future that'll be something that we can do again. And honestly, probably need practice at it again when the time comes. So that'll be an assignment we'll <laughs> roll out probably very soon in the future. Um, some some uh, other ones that I, I got from, from students that are great. Um, one of my students named Donovan, he he came up with this. He did this himself. He he wrote on something that he would see every day. I think he wrote it on some of his solo music that he was working on. He wrote, don't hold yourself back at the top of it. And, um, and so he would see that every time he was practicing. And uh, that, was, that was one that I thought was brilliant. I, I added that to our rotation. Um, another one from a student named Sam, he said, reach out to someone from your past who is not normally in your present. I think he went like on a fishing trip with an old like grade school friend that he hadn't seen in like seven years or something. So it's just amazing what what uh, what students can 
do because they, like I said, they have a, an intimate relationship with what both worlds mean. It's, it's not in their distant memory that when they were small children, um, so that they have that kind of ready to go, but they've just had a lot of negative layers kind of built over the top of that, that, that I've been trying to, to break off. And, and I found that, you know, if, if we can structure a classroom in that environment, you know, students will just open up to you so much. They'll, they'll, they'll be like, Oh my gosh, this is like, you know, we say the word safe space a lot. And then this is like, you know, something else that kind of goes along with that. And, and it's just, it's so, so cool how um, a lot of the musical problems we have, you know, if she oh, she's playing very softly and you know, I can never get her to use enough bow. And it's like, well, it's maybe because she's kind of like scared. Like there's just so many like mental and, and psychological issues that we have to, that we have to kind of address first before we add the physical nature of it. And it's, it's just really cool how, how all that works. And, and uh, so, yeah, but that's, that's um, a little bit of what I've been experiencing for just the last year, but it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I wish I had done it sooner. Cause I feel like, I feel like I've done more teaching in my last year, real teaching than I had in the eight years prior. And, and I think the, the students, that I've had would, would might even agree. They, they usually would say, even some of the ones that graduated recently, they'd usually come back and they'd be like, you know, something's kind of different about you. <laughs> you know, they, they, they would even be able to, to sense that. And then of course I would probably go, go off on them on this, you know, lecture that I just did right now, basically or of, of some form, but, but it's, it's really, it's really, really exciting. So that's, um, that's been, uh, how I've been spending my, my, uh, uh, headspace for the last time and it's it's been really fantastic and and with this you know new frontier the the post covid world you know it's going to be even harder to, to i think maintain as strong of connections and as strong as relationships as we have been so it's more important now than ever uh that we as teachers um find ways to to connect with our our students and and allow them to share all these all these things that they're that they're feeling so this is also true the ability to engage with the student on a personal level and to teach the whole child makes such a big difference so as we're talking about building a child let's have you go back to your own childhood what were your experiences and what helped you well that's great I mean, it's, you know it's when I was a little kid, I know one of the one of the examples I shared where it's like the you know the kid that raises their hand enthusiastically and then over time like does not like I was definitely one of those kids. That was that was definitely me um, as as a small kid because I you know it's like, yeah. And then by the time I was in high school, I, I usually didn't even raise my hand to ask questions anymore. Like if I was sitting in a Zoom meeting, um, unless I was specifically like you know asked something. You know, I'd, I'd be probably on mute, camera off, like that. That would be probably how I would be as a as a high school student now. So, um, so that was kind of one thing I was thinking of, and especially musically. You know, um, when I was a little kid, I I had access to a lot of different instruments, and it was just so fun to play around with. And then, you know, later on, you kind of make it like a chore. And sometimes we forget. You know, we our what we call when we practice. Oh, I you know I we play right. I play an instrument. We, we kind of forget about that that childlike excitement uh, that we bring to our our own music making. So I think that's been a big a big uh, challenge for me to to tap into. That that's been the the power and and, and the the emotion that comes with that, right? Like conducting Mahler Five. I'm, I was probably thinking at the time about all these technical things, right? Okay, I have to slow down and subdivide and think about. Okay, I got to move my arm like this, and and I wasn't thinking about you know making music with with love as the as the focal point right so um whereas as a little kid you know that's they just it's just all about emotion and, and things so i think that uh you, we, we can use that combined power so but yeah i mean i as far as my my background goes i mean i i played a lot of different instruments growing up and just loved it uh, my main ones were a French horn and band that I started in fifth grade, and then I got a I got a bass when I was an eighth grader. Uh, we didn't have an orchestra, 
uh, and my school is a very small town of about a thousand people in Southwest Kansas. So no orchestra for like probably four hours. I'd probably have to drive to a, a pretty major area to see one, but um, found a violinist who was able to give me lessons because um, I didn't know what rosin was. I think I told this story a couple times at various um, music teacher meetings and stuff, but you know, I had no idea what rosin was because I just saw that little, you know, cube of it in the thing. It was like, okay, that's, weird um so i tried I mean, it was about a month of playing my bass without actually having rosin on a bow so you can imagine how much my world changed when i had that teacher finally explain what that was <laughs> so but um but yeah so that's that was kind of my my earlier on kind of story i guess it is always interesting hearing different stories of music educators taking different paths in order to get where they are now and actually as you're talking that got me thinking quite a bit about myself as a high school student and as a music educator i used to be one of those kids who used to raise their hand all the time in class and slowly over time that diminished uh, so what you are talking about is very valuable and I'm hoping that it could be helpful to music educators as well. Thank you for being a part of the show and hopefully we can have you back on a different episode talking about different music ideas. Thanks. Thanks so much.